Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Monday's edition of FX Closing Bell. My name is Tyler Yell. I'm a currency analyst and trading instructor here at Daily FX, provided by IG Group, uh, and it is a pleasure to be with you all today. We do have some big moves to take a look at. Uh, Really, in a few markets, the the big one, of course, was the was the gold 1.8 million uh, ounces traded within basically a second uh, around nine o'clock this morning in London. So, uh, what's what's fascinating to see is is how that aligned with what's going on on the charts. We'll take a look at that for sure. Uh, hope everybody is doing well. Before we get into what I would call the fun stuff, uh, the meat of the session, uh, I do need to take care of some housekeeping. Uh, this is a recorded session for what it's worth, so uh, you will be able to watch this again if you'd like. You are welcome to ask me questions live. Uh, this is a risk disclaimer stating that trading on margin can result in losses that exceed deposited funds. Uh, it's important to fully understand the risks involved in trading. If you have questions, of course, you're welcome to ask me. Uh, the other disclaimer is our hypothetical, hypothetical trading disclaimer, which states that there are no guarantees in profits. There are no guarantees from you attending this session that, that you will be uh, engaged in a profitable trade. So uh, it's again worth it to be aware of the risks that are present when trading uh, and this is informative in nature, not necessarily a session for me to give you explicit trade details. Uh, if you have questions that you're not able to ask when we are live, as we are now, uh, feel free to reach out to me, tl at dailyfx.com or at forexl. Uh, I, am, I am here for you. Also, it's worth noting that uh, when registering for this, uh, if you wish, you do have access to an IEG demo account that you can use to really put what you are learning into practice. So uh, if you have questions again on how to use that, don't hesitate to reach out to me. You have my contact information there. All right, and with that, for those of you that are new, first off, welcome, glad you're here. Uh, this is a chance for us to really pull apart some of the key stories, the themes that are developing and building up. Uh, and, and really, I think themes are a, a huge component of understanding what's driving markets and where our focus should be when we're trading. Uh, the typical session length is about 30 minutes. We do go. We do go at usually uh, a few minutes here, either greater or or less than that. But that that's typically what we stick to. Uh, in terms of what we're looking at, uh, I would I would absolutely focus on the further weakness in the dollar, and we're seeing that in a few places. Now I'm going to switch back and forth between slides, which just allows me to organize the thoughts and share with you what we're talking about um, and and the the charts. Um, and and so with that today we had the Chicago Fed index as well as the durable goods orders, uh, which were in, in no uncertain words disappointing. So I'm gonna bring up here the DXY, uh, which thanks to the yen uh, and a few other things has, has fared a bit better later in the session. In fact, we've seen risk come off a bit, but uh, all, all that being said, we're still keeping an eye here on DXY, basically this environment where, you know, yes, we've, we've tumbled about 7% since the peak, uh, but we have we have questions about, are we gonna be able to see a move higher? One of the things that is concerning there uh, is quite simply yield. So as uh, US yields continue to move lower, uh, that continues to be concerning. One of the top focuses we've had, and we'll talk about uh, a decent amount in today's session. Uh, so gold, we had that sharp move today. In fact, let me use this chart just since that has the, the lines that we've been looking at. Uh, this top line here actually comes from the 2011 peak. Um, so we've been keeping an eye on that. It, it makes a little bit more sense on the weekly chart uh, in, in which you can see, okay, we're, we're remaining under basically resistance. And so from a broader perspective, that's the concern for long-term gold upside. Um, I, I would note quite simply that uh, gold tends to do well in a dollar week market, and we're not seeing a lot of that. A, a decent part of that is that yield picture. It's in the current environment, as yields continue to push lower, but risk stays supported uh, and inflation concerns also dissipate, uh, that's that's not necessarily the tender that allows that allows uh, the sparks to turn into a fire for, for gold. Uh, however, uh, I, I will say that from a sentiment perspective, it does look like we could see quite simply a bit a bit lower move in gold, and we'll talk about that in more detail later. Uh, and for those of you that follow the strong week index, that something that we put together in which we look at from a relative basis on a four hour chart with a 200 period moving average, which currency is the strongest and which currency is the weakest? Well, not a lot has changed. Um, and really in the strong week perspective, nothing has changed. Uh, we remain with pound kiwi being the strong week pair. Now, when I say that, it's important to note, 
pound is the weakest on a relative basis in the G8, and Kiwi is the strongest and, and could continue to strengthen. So uh, I'll tell you for what it's worth and, and some of the pairs that we'll be looking at, like Euro Yen, which looks like it's going to attempt new new 20, 2017 highs, uh, looks like Yen could start to put some pressure on pound for the weakest spot. And so for those of you watching that, it'd be worth it to keep an eye on this chart. If we are able to break higher, uh, that would likely soon see Kiwi Yen become the new strong weak pair if the Kiwi strength holds. And you can see how, how aggressive this move higher has been. All right, let's look at some of the top movers. So what we were just talking about, uh, yen weakness resuming. Uh, Aussie caught a small bid, not a lot happening uh, in, in, in the land down under. And, and we can take a look at a few different stories there. Uh, but all that being said, uh, when, when, when you look at, when you look at uh, the commodity currencies today, Aussie's done one of the be has, has done better than uh, than most. Uh, it's been a pretty quiet day all in all in terms of G10 FX stripping out the yen. So yen's been the big mover. Uh, but all, all that being said, uh, keeping an eye here. Uh, let's also go to pound Aussie. So we've seen some Aussie strength. Pound Aussie's basically sitting right there in that environment where we could be working on a breakdown lower, which to me is one that I would personally like to see. Uh, let's go over to commodities. So oil, uh, oil is holding the line, uh, the line being this this zone right here. And we'll, we'll talk about oil in a bit more detail when we really focus on commodities. But what I would share with you guys is that we, we have seen uh, net length go to 11 month lows when we looked at the CFTC data. And, and we'll show that uh, in, in a moment. But we're not, we don't have positive fundamental data. There's, <laughs> for, from an oil standpoint, Baker Hughes showed the 23rd straight weekly increase uh, of new active rigs, uh, and it still seems to show like we have an environment that's going to encourage uh, hedging from EMP producers, meaning that anytime the, the market props up, they're going to sell trying to lock in that price from a hedging perspective. So there still seems to be quite a bit of uh, negative fundamentals. Uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that in a bit more detail, but gold has risen um, and you, you don't really see that from a positioning standpoint, that, that argument that we're going to get a, a flush out, the weakness could continue. It doesn't seem like we're going to see the capitulation that we, we've been seeing in recent days just because we continue to see hedge funds come out of their trades per the CFTC data. Uh, again, the big one on the day, it was really, I'm going to go to a uh, very short-term chart. Uh, it was this one uh, in, in which we saw, again, 1.8 million ounces uh, traded in one minute. So very, very aggressive move. Um, and, and on that, you had a lot of people you know, really scratching their heads trying to figure out what happened. Why, why, was, this, there's, why was there a plunge um, as 1.8 million ounces, excuse me, was traded uh, in, in one minute? But uh, all that being said, it sunk like a stone. You can see here we're basically moving sideways. Uh, and you know, from a from a trend perspective, if you're somebody that did not have access to see fat fingers or whatever, um, you would note, okay, this 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 has that feeling, this has that look like a, you know, we would call it a third a third wave in Elliott wave terms, a kind of choppy continuation pattern here, uh, or consolidation pattern, which would likely favor continuation to the downside. So, um, dollar has been roughly stable, though the data has remained weak. The Fed has kind of supported the dollar, for lack of a better word, by policy talk continuing to support what's going to happen uh, in the next few years. Uh, I, I would look at this and say, you know, from a punt perspective, I'd be looking at a move lower. Uh, not a trade recommendation for myself, Daily FX or IG, but I would anticipate that next big move being a, being a move lower in, in gold, just given the environment we have. And then copper's been roughly flat. Uh, and then also, so we, we took a look earlier at the TNX. Uh, no, sorry, it's five minute charts. That's why it's so choppy. Uh, so this continues to trade below that, uh, trade below the the trend line that we've been focusing on. Uh, but another another key story is the long bond. So that 530 yield spread uh, has punched also to 2017 lows. And so that that's important because that, that tends to show inflation expectations, long-term growth expectations, things of that nature. And so um, as the flattening continues, that, that tends to be a pretty worrisome sign. And then in terms of equities, uh, we did see we did see a bit of a uh, of a late day stabilization, if you will, a bit of a turnaround that helped dollar yen move higher, uh, but also one of the bigger movers uh, has been the uh, the CSI 300 in China. Let's see if I can get that on here. Not not very clear there. So um, what's, in, what's important to know 
I'm sorry, I haven't, I haven't I usually use it off of uh, the Bloomberg terminal. But uh, what's, what's important to note is that over the last three days, we've seen uh, a little greater than a 5% increase in the, uh, the CSI 300. So pretty, pretty strong moves there. Uh, again, in terms of the most compelling chart, to me, the focus would naturally be uh, on gold. And so I, I did span out a bit looking at the weekly chart, which helps explain what's going on with this long-term resistance line. But whether you look at the weekly chart, the daily chart, or the short term, we looked at a five minute chart earlier where you saw that plunge, uh, it does seem to favor that we could see a move sub 1230 uh, and, and possibly to 1215. So that, that to me in the gold specter is, spectrum, excuse me, is, is what I'm keeping an eye on. Uh, and I'll, I'll have a chart that just kind of shows the commodity index in a moment. Uh, and it, it just seems to, it seems to show that there, there, there doesn't look to be a catalyst really within the commodity sector as a whole uh, for, for a strong move higher in, uh, in gold. All right, so over to rates. So uh, the first major market I'd like to spend some time in, and I'll have a handful of charts here. Most of the charts today will be concentrated in commodities, uh, but, but a, few, a few key stories worth pulling out which really add to some of the big themes that have been going on in the markets. First, the U.S. Treasury auction, the two-year bid-to-cover ratio was the highest uh, at auction since 2015, uh, which again, while, while the Fed is seemingly on course for a December hike, which the euro dollar curve favors right now. Uh, it, it does, we do continue to see an increase in action, which let me just pull up this chart here. So an increase in action in indirect bidders. And so that's what you see here. This purple bar is indirect bidders. Indirect bidders basically being uh, are, are, are non-banks. Um, so, you know, pension funds, mutual funds. Uh, but what, what we're seeing here is people basically that have access to other markets are grabbing the yield that is currently available. So uh, pretty aggressive bid to cover ratio uh, and, and tends to show the demand that really that reach for take the yield that's that's given now. Uh, and and it, in, a, in a sense, as you get a flattening yield curve, it makes sense that that's where you'd want to be basically on the front end. Um, it, because it's it's showing longer term doubts, um, and so all that being said, it, it, seeing this this two year auction result uh, does make some sense. Now, also I think a bit discouraging, but it makes sense also just seeing what we've seen. And if I pull up that that TNX chart again, uh, so the TNX chart is the ten year the ten year note yield for the U S. Uh, you could see here uh, just this lack of volatility. It's been it's been very trend focused. It's been lower, uh, but the volatility has been very low. So this this chart from Bloomberg, courtesy of Bloomberg, uh, you can see here uh, how low the volatility is. We're basically at 2006 lows in terms of uh, monthly ranges. So all that being said, it, it aligns with what we were talking about recently when we said, you know, listen, financial conditions right now are pretty favorable for the Fed to continue hiking. What I mean by that is while there are arguments for a policy error in the making, meaning quite simply that doesn't appear to be the growth down the road that's supporting the optimism the Fed has. Uh, you could you could make the argument that because conditions are so easy, they're getting free hikes, which is a, a phrase I've used before. Uh, also, so when I use the term flattening, for those of you that are not familiar with it, it's it's pretty, uh, it's, it's, it's a it's an argument that basically says if you look at the uh, the yield of the front end of the curve versus the long end of the curve, um, or you you sell you sell the front end uh, and then you buy the long end, what are you looking at? As that flattens, that basically makes the argument that um, yes, that there's there's some steam happening right now, meaning there's some momentum going now on the front end in the short term, but longer term there's a lot of doubts, and so that's what we mean when the basically the spread between a short end yield, uh, short end fixed income product or sovereign bond, and a long end uh, fixed income product or bond uh, when that when that yield compresses. And so I mentioned earlier the 30 year. U.S. yield is at year-to-date lows. There's a global yield grab going on, and the reason why that tends to go on uh, is concerns. We've also talked about, I think it was last week, I think it was last week, uh, but the Mexican yield curve has inverted. The one-year yield is higher than the 10-year yield, right? And so that, that shows that, you know, once you start looking out, there's not a lot of confidence. There might be confidence now, uh, but there's, there's not a lot of confidence. China also had a 110 inversion um, where the one-year yield was higher than the 10-year yield. So it's, it's, again, it's something that while in emerging markets you could say that shows some confidence, uh, on the other end you could also say that that, that shows a lot of doubt in terms of future growth. Uh, so that's that's really the key thing there. And that's this this is basically the Bloomberg 
<laughs> the Bloomberg uh, signal, uh, or, which is U.S. yield curve five year, thirty year. So I know it looks like a cat walked on my keyboard, but that's that's what you're looking at there. Um, and then again, uh, the the weak the weak inflation themes persist. So let me go over to. Uh, oh, I think it's in the commodity. It's in the commodity. So it'll it'll complement what we looked at commodity. But basically, uh, the inflation components continue to be falling away, basically running right through our fingers. All right, so uh, we did have we did have that you know what looked to be a fat finger trade. Uh, again, uh, very very aggressive. Uh, very very aggressive move in a short period of time, uh, which brought that drop down in gold. Now again, shocks tend to happen in the direction of the trend. That's something I've learned time and time and time and time again. Um, you know, whatever whatever zone you want to take on, usually when you see a shock, it's not at the top of a move. Um, it, it aligns with what's happening um, already. So that being said, you know, take a take a rather obvious example, if you will, 2008, right? The market peaked in 2007, fall of 2007, uh, was going down, concerns, 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 and then 2008 came as basically a wave three. We didn't hit that wave five, if you will, basically until uh, in, until Q1 2009, uh, and then the move higher. All that being said, all that being said, um, shocks tend to happen in the direction of the trend. So if this was an in direction of the trend shock, that would, that would argue that the trend will resume lower for gold. So that that was my takeaway for what it's worth with that quote unquote fat finger trade. Um, also looking at crude oil. So uh, you can see here the number of short positions is increasing pretty aggressively, highest on year. So what this is showing, you could see the, 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 the bars here. These bars quite simply are the the price, the futures price. Um, so it's WTI futures. Uh, the white line, as you can see, is per CFTC, uh, the, the short positions, so aggregate short positions. Uh, and they're rising. One of the reasons why they're rising is because supply is not stopping. We just continue to get more and more and more supply. And so on Friday, while I didn't have my session with you guys, and I, I promise I did miss you guys, um, we basically have this environment where, uh, you know, 23 straight weeks, we continue to see more and more coming on the market, uh, and that was evidenced by the Baker Hughes number, which you could see there. Um, over the last year, uh, we have gone from 341 to 758, uh, so just this, you know, about 120% increase. Uh, this is this is the inflation component that I was that I was wanting to share with you guys earlier, and I'll go back to the the slide with the the key stories. But um, so this is this is taken from the terminal. It's not a very good picture, but what it basically shows is it. it it shows how you know really we're, we're we're seeing some positivity in precious metals, uh, others in livestock, uh, but outside of that, agriculture, energy, um, industrials is uh, is also trying to hold to some of its gains from earlier in the year. But all that being said, you could see agriculture and energy, which are two huge inflation components, um, are just continuing to fall back and fall back and fall back further. So uh, th this is this is showing you basically that, that sucking sound, which is the inflation forecasts. All right, so back to this slide. Appreciate y'all's patience with me. Uh, so one of the other things that have been in focus, you know, when you, when you look at uh, – the junk debt market. Naturally, it's being cheaper to roll over money. We we're talking about the flattening yield curve, which basically means that the reference price, the, pref the reference cost uh, of rolling over debt is getting cheaper when the yields drop. Uh, so that's helpful. It definitely gives more breathing room to companies that do not have uh, do not have good margins. However, there's there's definitely a focus on this forty dollar a barrel zone. If we break below that forty dollar a barrel zone, uh, that that is the point in which the industry is starting to show that there could be fault lines starting to happen. And uh, I'll tell you, it's, it's, it's becoming this ironic environment because it's almost like we need bad news to become good, to, to turn into good news in the crude oil market. What I mean by that is, you know, while you have cheap money and while you have these projects getting approved, it's basically bringing on more and more and more rigs. Uh, and even OPEC seems to be pretty confound or confused by what's going on. But all, all that being said, we, we do not have, any types of shocks that are taking oil off of the market, taking supply out of the market. And so that's why it seems like we could continue to have a decent amount of pressure uh, in crude. Um, and, and while we are getting a bounce, again, we saw short short positions are rising. We're seeing supply is rising. Uh, there's, there's a few other things we could look at. But all, all that being said, as this continues, uh, it seems it seems to favor that the trend will, will continue to break down. And if we get below 40, that's when from a credit 
perspective, but you don't have to look at credit markets. I'll keep an eye on them for you and let you know if anything gets hairy. But from a credit perspective, that's where the focus will start to turn. If we get below $40, say, okay, who has the weakest balance sheet? Who has the most debt? Who's going to have the hardest time servicing that debt? Uh, at what point then could we start to see, uh, you know, possibly some projects get shelved, possibly start to help the supply issue? Um, now, for what it's worth, typically in these environments, you know, when there is a bankruptcy or anything of that nature, because of the type of assets that are involved for what it's worth, typically there's just a new name on the rig. Um, and, and so the asset keeps producing. So that's, that's again, it's, it, it takes a while for these to turn. Um, and so it's not necessarily going to be a, a V bottom, I don't think at least, uh, but it's but it's worth keeping an eye on that. Uh, if we do start to get a move below 40, longer term, that could be one of the better things for the market in terms of stability. But right now we're getting so much supply coming on, uh, it's pretty difficult. Uh, and then another just an industry note for what it's worth. Um, so uh, Rio Tinto um, in, in, in Australia, the mining company, basically they, they have a handful of coal mines that have been uh, the have been the apple of Glencore's eyes, but uh, Glencore, the uh, the Swiss-based trader, uh, unlikely to get them. And so, with that, with that, quite simply, uh, the 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 Rio board has gone in and said, "Listen, we think that uh, Yoncore, um, which is a Chinese energy company, uh, is the is the is the is the better buyer." So, just uh, just some industry news there worth worth keeping an eye on, and uh, we'll continue to see how that develops. All right, so on to FX. So in the FX world, this is the strong week grid that I like to put together and show you guys what's basically not worth fighting and what's you know on both the long side and the short side. So what I mean by that is I don't like I don't like selling the strongest and I don't like buying the weakest. What's weak can be weak for a reason. That old saying there's never there's never just one cockroach. Um, and same thing on the or the inverse on the strong side, there tends to be multiple threads to the strong currency story, meaning there's more going on than just one one post as to why that currency is strong. So, uh, New Zealand dollar remains strong. You can see there at the top of the board is commodity currencies. I know that might seem odd based on what we're showing you from earlier, but that's where the yields are from a from a from a sovereign perspective. That's where the yields seem to be seem to be the strongest, and so we we continue to see flow into into these commodity currencies. So we didn't spend a lot of time with dollar CAD. Dollar CAD, and we'll talk about this specifically in the FX uh, section, uh, is is really to me at a favorable point for a breakdown. Uh, what's been fascinating is the strength that we've seen as oil has gone into a bear market because you, you think well. The, the the correlation isn't clean. I'm going to throw a, an overlay for you. I'll take off Ichimoku so you're not looking at so many things that your your eyes start to cross. All right, so let me take off Ichimoku. Take off the moving average. Then I'll adjust the scale. All right, so since December high, uh, basically we've seen a 22, 23% drop in crude oil. Um, all, all that being said, you can see we've we've similarly uh, we've we've seen since May this incredible strength of the Canadian dollar. Well, if oil is able to hold, which as you've heard from me recently, I, I don't necessarily think that's a good sign or a good thing to uh, a good bet to make in my opinion. Uh, but all that being said, we have seen strength in the Canadian dollar. A currency that is historically correlated to oil, as oil has gotten sold off aggressively, a big part of that has been the the optimism the Bank of Canada has shown, despite some of you know despite the drop in energy, and and we've even heard Polas, Governor of Bank of Canada, come out and say, listen, rate cuts we did in years past have done their job. They've allowed the the economy to have some flexibility. Well, um, this this week we're going to have another senior deputy of the Bank of Canada, as well as Polos speaking uh, in Europe on I believe Wednesday, um, and so we'll get some more signs as to as to their confidence. Now we had basically mixed signals last week in Canada. So on Thursday we had retail sales, which were show, was showed that for the first half of the year retail sales was off to its best start since 1991. Then we had basically weaker inflation data, but again. That's 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 not a Canada specific phenomenon. We're continuing to see weak inflation data. A big part of that, as I just showed you, is the agriculture and the and the energy. Excuse me. So, uh, does it mean that we couldn't hear 
tightening statements or hawkish statements from the Bank of Canada. And if we did, uh, as I've mentioned before, my concern from a uh, from a technical perspective is is whether or not we're going to break this channel. Because if we do break this channel, that to me would open up the argument that we could start to see a move sub 130 uh, and potentially be a continuation of this aggressive move down from a from a pattern perspective. All right, uh, so let's go to some of the key the key stories. So uh, again, while dollar has been a bit supported, uh, we did have further weak data with dur with durables and Chicago Fed index. Uh, there's also concerns that as we get into quarter end selling, given given the strength of U.S. equity assets and U.S. Treasuries, uh, that is, if you get basically rolling out, this is called month quarter end rebalancing, uh, naturally quarter and month-end are going to happen at the same time, but all that being said, we could get some quarter end rebalancing that keeps USD selling pressure on. So to me, that's worth keeping an eye on. Not, not a lot of you know technical argument there, but when looking at that quarter end, you basically say, okay, globally, what assets are the strongest? Where has, where has money been attracted to? The lower yield shows us that's happened in the U.S. The higher stock shows us also that's happened in the U.S. over the last quarter. And so as international accounts look to sell out, balance those accounts, th that could lead to some dollar selling. So that's worth keeping an eye on. Uh, again, mentioned earlier that we do have Bank of Canada speakers on deck. It's worth seeing if they basically look through the week CPI uh, and, and, and focus on some of the strengths elsewhere or if they do pull back. Either way, that could lead to some CAD volatility. Uh, and then uh, this is one that uh, I've been focusing on lately. Uh, which is dollar max, and so dollar max has just recently broke below the first target on this breakdown. Um, so you could see we basically took out this this one year trend line, uh, and in so doing, look to have this nice setup here. So I like the dollar weak story. I like the EMFX selectively strong story. Again, it's that it's that global grab for a yield theme. Uh, but all that being said, let me throw up Ichimoku just to complement what's being shown on the chart. All that being said, this this seemed to, seems to me to favor what we're seeing, which is that 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 trend is remaining strong for now. Uh, another anecdote, if you will, uh, is the Argentinian century bond. Right, Argent Argentina has been in default, I think, six to seven times in the last century. Right, and they just came out with the century bond at about 8.9 percent. And and fixed income, as some of you know, and some of you will learn, uh, it's it's an environment where a yield can, you know, the same yield can be incredibly expensive or incredibly cheap, depending on who's paying the interest. Right, and, and somebody that has defaulted six or seven times, you know, in in the span of that same fixed income instrument, 9% to me seems incredibly expensive. That seems incredibly expensive uh, given the uncertainty that the, the, the current government that's basically only been there for two years is going to be able to meet the, uh, the, required, the required adjustments um, that, that, that need to be made, uh, the austerity plans that need to go into place to really fix the economy. So all that being said, it's still short term. I know a lot of people like to look out long term and then project it into the immediate future. Uh, that doesn't tend to work well in the markets. Short term, it tends to show that there is this just quite simply very favorable risk on environment, which I think is going to favor uh, MEX. And you know, quite simply, when MEX does well, yen typically doesn't. Now, when yen doesn't do well, it tends to be a more of a risk on environment. So while we're keeping an eye here to see if we can break above the cloud, uh, again, the ones I'm watching, Euro yen, uh, Kiwi yen, CAD yen. Um, so, so these to me are ones to be watching because if equities get their footing, then uh, that could be a setup that we start to see yen weakness resume. Again, when we had the Bank of Japan speak recently, they basically forfeited the right, call it what you will, uh, forfeited the option to discuss tapering, which was seen as a which was seen as a dovish outcome. All right, and then in terms of uh, in terms of uh, sentiment, sometimes sentiment speaks loudly, um, and that tends to happen when you see big moves on absolute terms. Other times, you have to look for it on relative terms. So on a relative term basis, what you can see here is that the shorts are basically leaving the market, and so we're seeing a very very similar thing on oil. Let me just give you actually an overall sentiment view, so you can see this because I think it's helpful. So look here, if you will, if you'll direct your attention there. So you can see both silver, actually a bit more than gold, but silver and gold shorts on a weekly change, uh, pretty aggressive, pretty aggressive drop. Um, so with gold, what we saw was about a 30% decline in, make sure I get the number right, 
38% decline in shorts from last week. Uh, and then you go over to silver, uh, and silver is showing a 48% decline uh, in shorts from last week. Now, again, we typically take a contrarian view to crowd sentiment. So when we see that traders are leaving the short position, that might actually indicate that that's the place that they should be uh, or that, that the market will be heading. Uh, because again, it's a contrarian indicator. So that would sit, that would tend to suggest, excuse me, spot silver and spot gold prices may continue to fall. So that's what I'm keeping an eye on in terms of the sentiment highlight. All right, you guys were super patient. So thank you. First, second, let's go ahead and get to some of these questions. Uh, question here, Bagnani, good to see you, buddy. Says, is the dollar yen rally correlated to the sell-off in gold? Good question. Uh, now today's move in today's move in dollar yen, I would say no, but overall. Naturally, I would say coming off of the highs in gold do align with the weakness in yen. So as you can imagine, as dollar yen moves higher, that's indicating yen weakness. That tends to align with gold dollar moving down. Um, gold dollar meaning XAU, USD, gold being priced in dollars. I hope that makes sense. But uh, short, short answer, yes. I would say that those are correlated. And if yen continues to move higher, then we'll likely see gold continue to move lower. Uh, and Augusto, I would think so. If if we get, and, and again, that's why I like the dollar yen, excuse me, the dollar max, um, because it, to me it aligns with a weaker yen, higher equity. So to me, I, I do like that. Uh, good question. Nico's talking about the good German data that came out today. So let's go over to Euro USD. Uh, we've been sitting right around that 112 zone. All right, we've come off a bit here, um, but yeah, so let me go to a shorter term, and, and uh, as I showed you earlier today, we, we did have some dollar weakness, which quite simply was met with some dollar strength. So uh, on this, this this to me is, is still in an environment where we don't have we don't have a lot of encouragement short term. Longer term, I still like Euro. I think Euro could see a move higher, similar to we saw a move higher in dollar back in 2014. So I, I while dollar is looking up short term, I still like Euro. And I'm going to go back, if, I hope you don't mind, I'm going to go back to that strong week chart, mainly to make the argument that, that because I like Euro, doesn't necessarily have to be Euro USD. I still think that longer term, that's probably a that's probably a pretty clean play, um, but naturally Euro Pound has been one I've focused on, Euro Yen as, as one as well. Uh, but yeah, uh, Nikos is absolutely right. We had the uh, the IFO uh, data from from Germany, which was which was pretty encouraging, especially compared to the uh, the U.S. sentiment. Uh, I, I will tell you one of the one of the things I was keeping an eye on was basically this 12:15. Obviously, we broke above that this morning, so now uh, I would basically be holding. I'd basically be holding this recent low. I think it was around 11. Okay, I guess it's right around 112. I thought it was around 1190, 1195. But um, all, all that being said, so this um, this let me actually mark it specifically. Just while we're here. So yeah, 11119. 19. One eleven ten down here, so we'll continue to keep an eye on this. But if we can hold this support, that would be one of the first indications that says, okay, we could be making a move higher. And naturally, what I've been what I've been wanting to see was, given this sharp rise higher, and again we talked about euro yen earlier, we're seeing these impulsive setups in other euro crosses as well. Uh, but this this looks like a call a consolidation or a correction that's eating up more time than price, which tends to not be indicative of a reversal, i.e. significant dollar strength. Rather, quite simply, uh, I would I would favor euro strength. So whether we play it against dollar or something else, either way, I do like uh, I do like what we're seeing. I do like what we're seeing here. Um, again, while we have the Fed basically kind of for lack of a better phrase, kind of pushing us into a corner and just saying, hey, December is going to be a hike. Uh, I still think that there's a lot of room for them to disappoint in terms of, you know, two, three years out. So uh, th that to me is, is probably where that next, if we get it, if we get it, that's a big statement, but if we get it, that next chunk of, of dollar weakness is going to come is where they start to pull back on their 2018, 2019 forecasts. Um, to be seen, but again, it, it, it's, 
I, I wrote an article on uh, on Friday uh, about the Fed balance sheet. Uh, basically, the argument being that the the main tool the Fed is going to have is pulling back interest rates since they're not looking to reverse the uh, the balance sheet. Uh, runoff. And so there's an argument that they are trying to get it as high as possible uh, so that when the business cycle does turn over, as business cycles do, um, that that's that's the, that's the bullets they'll have in the gun um, is, is interest rate cuts since they're not going to have the balance sheet flexibility they've had in times past. All that being said, um, I do think you have an environment where short term we're getting a bit of resistance in terms of continued dollar weakness but i think you have the the longer term environment that favors again in my view nico's pretty significant euro strength does that make sense buddy i hope i hope that helps and i hope it's pretty clean i mean we we continue to see this this choppy sideways move but uh, i still i still like that uh, that view for longer term dollar weakness and so, Patrick, I hope that helps uh, you as well. All right, guys. So with that, I'll be back tomorrow. Um, went a little bit longer, but had some some catching up to do since I was out on Thursday or Friday, or at least didn't hold a session on Thursday and Friday. But uh, nonetheless, I hope this was a helpful session. It was recorded. Uh, I'm hoping to put this in an article format today. Um, I'm just due to some other constraints on on my schedule. I'm not sure if I'll be able to, uh, but if nothing else, it's a recorded session. I'll make sure that it gets put out into a uh, into our YouTube channel. If you guys have any questions, uh, would love to hear from you. Uh, always, always enjoy talking markets with you guys. Trade well. Talk to you tomorrow. Keep your heads up. Take care, guys.